Live on the stream. We are live on the stream, man. Everyone can dream. Uh, all right. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. All set. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. Is this the live stream or is this the recording of the show? You know what? That'll be the beginning of this episode of the Weird Things Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Ahoy, ahoy. I thought it's time we do a real-time investigation here, folks. Uh-oh. I'm on the case. An RTI. I, have, uh, I just saw this. I actually saw this like a few days ago, a week ago. I don't know. Time just is just a flat circle. And I'm like, I need, I can't go into this alone because I don't know what I might be you know, encountering because it could be paradigm shifting and I need to be there with my bros. So, right. Brian, I'm sending you a link. Okay. We may have the first documented evidence of predator aliens in a backyard in Las Vegas. Uh, now, right. when, when you say predator aliens, you'd mean just an alien who is predacious, or do you mean the characters, the licensed characters of predators and xenomorphs slash aliens? Or are we making this political? I can't, I don't know if they're respecting copyright law, but apparently these aliens are using some kind of cloaking technology. Mm. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, here, I'm, Brian. We I'm, have to take a look at this. We've been summoned. Well, I'm, I and I'm glad we finally incorporated in five different counties and got all of the appropriate permits. And I got a third mortgage on my uh, uh, grandmother's property in order for us to be able to conduct these investigations, that which give us the ability to play the following. Hold on. Uh, mm -hmm. Allow ads on Fox News. Okay. Um, note to self. <laughs> it, it to me, you know, I applied the same principles that I would apply to any kind of a homicide investigation. Right? Okay, uh, sorry, uh, that that was not just Robert Young, as many people would suppose. Uh, I have to. Hope. I noted Fox and Friends host Justin Robert Young. You know, I have been filling in. It, on, it, to uh, me, or, or, you know, I, I applied I can't, the same it's, principles it's, 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 that they're I would apply playing to the, any kind of a homicide I can't, I can't disable. Right? Yes. And you have the to look ads. at the totality the of the evidence. page. And you're going to have debunkers uh, that'll be like, If I do that, then do we get to hear it again? Here we go. Yep. Okay. And then meanwhile, I don't even know how on Bing ads are prevented. It, Ju it, to me, you know, I applied the same principles that I Ju would apply Ju Justin, to any I, kind of a homicide. I feel like we could pretty much make a call on this one. <laughs> well, I don't know what it is. I have not seen any any version of it. No, no, nor do I. But okay. But, I, but what I'm asking desperately is for you to fill air so oh, I can yeah. figure well, out Brian, why. You know what it you got to understand play. about Las Vegas is it's an arid climate. You know, with the <laughs> desert, you got a, you got some air pressure situations that you don't normally see. You've got uh, a lot of backyards, a lot of zero scaping. So maybe you'll be able to hear footsteps in a way that you wouldn't on grass. These are the kind of things that we need to come. Uh, uh, prepared with as we see the evidence that is going to be presented before us. Predator aliens. The, the, the story is that some people in Vegas, they saw a fireball in the sky and they saw two eight foot tall aliens in their backyard. What? Uh, okay. Well, I, I, I do believe there may be ads, but I believe that we have some footage here to look at. Uh, there's a red arrow, as we all know, that's code for you're about to see the real truth. Oh, hey. With Zim, you John can Stamos. Nope. I knew it all along. John <laughs> Stamos. <laughs> Definitely an Who ad. on earth couldn't have seen that coming? <laughs> Fun fact. The last time I saw John Stamos in person was in a Las Vegas casino. Really? Where? Yep, he was at a table, standing there gambling, I too, any looking kind of as handsome as you expect. Right? Uh, yeah. It's not and a TV you have trick. to look at the totality of the evidence. And you're going to have debunkers that'll be like, well, but the shadow, it could be, 
this, that, and the other. No, 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 it cannot. Uh, and You're going to have, you know, up. critical you thinking people using their brain. <laughs> All right, so hold on. Wait a minute. So we are looking at what looks to be some kind of smudge that is coming. It looks as if it's on the backside of a fence, so it doesn't look like it is... But, in front of the fence. But but you also already see it like on the front side. Open to be it honest, it looks like an review. episode of Cops, okay. like it, like from the beginning. You know, I applied. The yeah, this is also like that I would we're we're, we're talking about dozens of frames yeah. that we are looking at. This is not a a free running video where you you see things move in real time. This is quite possibly like one and a half seconds that is being played frame by frame. Photography. Anybody out there who's a qualified expert witness in video analysis like I? Okay, by the way, both of those. Uh, <laughs> anyone with a degree in photography, I'm going to guess, probably not the best qualified to respond to uh, digital obfuscation or artifacting. Exactly, because they're, well, yeah, but they're, they're, what do they know about aliens if they have a degree in photography? Uh, right? It, you got to have real alien experts like us. Uh, what, and it's what? very clear that these are tall aliens, so they're from the, like, Scandinavia of the universe. Um, and Which, as we all know, is, let's all say it together, Pluto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're cloaked, so they're royalty. Yeah. Who else wears cloaks? I Brian, am, come on. Uh, anybody Answer out that there one. with a master out there who's a qualified expert witness in video analysis like I am? A qualified so, video expert in So by by what, by the way, Scott Roder, his claim one of his claims to fame is he the Oscar Pistorius trial for explaining why Oscar Pistorius was innocent. <laughs> so mm. Uh, uh, so hold on how did this come across your your radar here man it's been out there for a while and it keeps getting attention and i can't you know all the problems all the videos are so compressed you just have to take everybody's word on what they're seeing and yeah i, I, you know, I so it's I, I would not know what to look at with that exactly. few frames just because things are weird in and also, we don't know whether or not that's a copy of a video which would have artifacting or if that was, it doesn't look like 4K. It doesn't look like it came right off a, a, a modern cell phone or anything like that. It does look like it's been passed around the internet a little bit. Yeah, so. Uh, I think it's aliens, man. personally. I think, I think I'm convinced it's aliens. It came down. I had they wanted to play some Baccarat. And they got lost somewhere else in Las Vegas, and uh, they decided to play a leprechaun. So I had a I had a conversation yesterday with uh, my buddy Paul Heineck, who was on his way to speak at a conference. Paul Heineck, uh, his father Jay Allen Heineck, the guy who did Project Blue Book, they actually did the you know the fictionalized TV story about that. Uh, Paul's a really cool guy. Actually worked with me on my uh, Discovery Channel Shark Week show. Known Paul for a while. Paul, we were talking about, uh, you know, aliens, alien civilizations, contact, stuff like that. I pointed out, like, why I have a problem with the whole dark forest hypothesis, the idea that, you know, everybody's in hiding because, because you know, he's like, well, you know, the universe is really big. And I said, and I, I don't want to, you know, misconstrue his arguments. I said, you know, there are a billion iPhones out there. Do you think a civilization a million year, more years advanced than us could send a billion iPhones out in every direction towards every star and see what's there? Like, yeah, of course, you know, in, in that context. So the thing I brought up was uh, if there are advanced aliens in our soul, in our, excuse me, in our galaxy, I think we've had flybys. I think they've mapped us. I think they know we're here. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, I guess if, if you want to look at us as a very primitive species to them then we would we would be like one of those uh uh you know tribes that uh has has not been touched by modern civilization but even then you know we've taken some pictures people have thrown some you know spears and stuff at drones oh yeah and we we can we can look at them on a satellite you know, yeah we, we could yeah we could, yeah we, we, we could, know we know what's going never on know the idea to them that hey yeah way up in the sky <laughs> There's a machine made yeah. by people like you looking down at you, watching you, and can see everything you're doing. Uh, might be kind eyes. of a crazy concept. Yeah, I, that that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. So why do you think they came to Vegas? 
I mean, why wouldn't you go to Vegas? Sin City, right? Yeah, you got yeah. Sphere. You yeah, know, you know who's in residency right now? Getting. <laughs> so, so I, uh, what? What do you think that the aliens wanted to have stay in Vegas? <laughs> like, like they're like, there's one place in this galaxy where I know things. Stay. What if? What if that was the height of debauchery? Is backyard walking? Like that, they never are allowed to do it, and now they'd be ashamed if their home civilization knew that they were walking in these backyards. I kind of related on visiting things. I was thinking about this the other day. Like, there's the joke about the reason the Titanic sunk was because of all the time travelers who traveled back in time to the Titanic to see <laughs> the sinking. And and I thought about this because uh, if I had a time machine. There was like a month period, and Justin knows it's like Taco Bell had like these nachos extreme, like these <laughs> really awesome nachos. Yes. And if somebody were to go back and look at like the drive through video feed and notice a guy driving a fake mustache, beard, like one after the other, like the same car, but it, like that's going to be your proof that I found time travel. Yeah. Because I'm just going to, I'm going to be like, I think if I was thinking about that, like, yeah, like one, I'm, I'm cheap. Like I would like try to go back to the 99 cent Big Mac promos, you know, I'd be doing that. I would just be going to like, just do a fast food tour of, you know, that would be amazing if it's just like, like, wow, there's a real big lunch rush at the uh, Tamarack Taco Bell here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this specific period of time. And then it's just nothing but Andrew in different disguises. It's Andrew, <laughs> Andrew with a mustache, Andrew with a beard, Andrew in a turban, Andrew, uh, yeah. uh, uh, with, a, 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 a looking like he plays bass for fog hat, like just as yeah. one after another one costume after the next. So, so, okay, if we're going to take a quick side jag into great time traveling moments, we all, have, we all have a time machine, but we can only use it to revisit the greatest fast food, fast food moments in all of history. Oh, man. Uh, so, so uh, number one for me would be early 90s, uh, 59, 79, 99 uh, at Taco Bell and peak $5 footlongs. At, at Subway. That's that's where I would go. You know, there there's there was <laughs> Wait, that and, really cool. and, and I was too young at the time, but apparently there was nickel pitcher nights at Double Dave's here in Austin. Well there there you remember we had that period of this the giant pizza wars. Yeah. Um do you remember uh when McDonald's came out with the Batman Big Mac, which was like the Batmobile? Uh, no. Nope. Do you remember this? I this do not. Long... No. Okay, uh, let me try to pull this up. Uh, no, no, no. While, here, here, while, while, you, you while, describe while it. that, while that to happens, uh, uh, I'm going to put in a little off the board here, but the big Montana at Arby's. Oh, man. Oh, still there. Still Is there. It still there. Still get it. No, yeah. I, like, I thought it went no, away. I thought it went away. No, they call it like the Pounder or whatever. Like, no, like it's a. Oh, maybe I, I, maybe I know what I'm going to get on my way back, but get. A big, uh, big, big chungus like that. So wait, two uh, sauces up top, two sauces on the bottom bun. Oh my good lord! That, that, this isn't just a, a toy commercial, is it? Uh, related to the animated series, is it? We're talking now about the Batman Big Mac. Yeah. No, no. I got, I got, I got, I got the video. It's incoming, incoming, Brian. Okay, okay. By incoming, I mean I haven't sent an email yet. But okay. It'll be incoming. Um. You, you, we've got video evidence proof that I'm not making this up. Um, and this was from Batman and Robin. So got I sent it. you, it, it's going through, it, it's going through the internets now. It's on its way. All right. And I, I listen, there is a, uh, you know, I missed the Mexi Melt. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. Talk about government Mexi Melt. Those nachos extreme, man. Those were great. Uh, was that the one where you, cause I know you've, Long had a, uh, a, a a true love gone away. That was the wild sauce at Taco Bell. Yeah, I, you know those wild sauce was really cool. I you know, sometimes I liked it, sometimes I didn't. But you know they were you know it's just the nineties. We don't know what we lost. Mm, let's find out. Persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir. I'll get drive-through. Introducing McDonald's Superhero Burger. 
Tomatoes, crisp lettuce, the great taste of two cheeses melted over three beef patties on a super Oh my god! Bun. It's McDonald's taste of the month. Everyone's making a break for. Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? So that is a Big Mac that is a, 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 a small sub sandwich with three patties laid down. That is, that's beefy. All in support of Batman Forever. I have from the Taco Bell wiki, Extreme Nachos. Extreme Nachos were available in summer of 1993. Oh, 1993. <laughs> <laughs> they, consisted, <laughs> they consist of a long three-compartment cardboard container. The outer compartment's holding red tortilla chips, and the center was for the dip. The dip was layered, refried beans, onion, cheddar cheese, wild sauce, diced tomatoes, chopped green onions, sour cream, guacamole, and black olives. I got rid of the olives. Uh, it, it was a thing of beauty. Like the the it was you could you could basically just take your chips and just dip it in like like heaven. <laughs> and it's gone now. It's gone. Okay, so Until so so our, our our official time travel picks are uh, well. Apparently, mine is still there. Um, the big the big Montana, but uh, uh, man, I don't know. Maybe. Certainly Taco Bell was the food that I ate the most. Like those early chalupas, those first chalupas, man, those did, hit. Did you ever get seduced by the uh, uh by the cinnamon twists? No. I'm not a I'm not well uh, like a real sweets guy. Mm. And actually, you know, you want to know what? It was the gorditas before the chalupas. I actually was more of a gordita guy than I was a chalupa guy. Yeah. But those were ooh. Six, I don't know, 69 cent soft tacos. I, don't, I, I, I mean, those still hit. You always remember your first. I always, I'll, I'll till this day at Taco Bell, whenever I go there, I'll do the, the burrito supreme and a, and, a, and a taco combo. But I'll usually go with a hard taco. Get a little crunch. I, so the question is, in all seriousness, you know, somebody pops out nowhere says here's here's a time machine watch press a button go anywhere you want what's the first place you go uh no longer we're no longer talking about fast food because now i'm very hungry and i want to go back to fast food talk but that's fine you can do, you can do that <laughs> uh okay do do i get to bring back any information or affect the universe materially or am i affecting a universe that i'll never see the effects of uh, you will go, you will affect the universe and I can give you a, a lengthy explanation why that's possible, but you can affect the universe. Okay. Uh, see, then now I want to provide for myself. So, uh, um, so this goes from altruistic or from, from selfish to altruistic. I, I, I cause it, cause in the initial idea with the fast food, it was like, you just want to. This eat. is candy, you know. Yeah. Like, like, where where do you want to go? But now, if, if we've introduced a world where you can affect things for good, then then you probably should, right? Otherwise, you're a bad person. Yeah, I guess. I guess also we should establish like, do I have any resources, or it's just me in? It, it, are are we going by Voyager's rules, where it's like it's just me and the clothes on my back, and the knowledge I have of history? Yeah, you literally. Brian, you got to put this risk watch on right now. That only you have two minutes to decide where to go, and then you don't get the option anymore. Okay. Okay. So, first thing, um, and 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 also, it's not like um, it's not like I suddenly become Brian in second grade if I go to 1982. It's like I'm Brian as a 50 year old man, just suddenly dressed weirdly in 1982. If that's where I choose to go. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all. Spoiler alert: The year is 1982. Uh, the uh, 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 oh man, how how long do I have? Uh, you can go back anytime you want. No, no, no. I mean, subjectively, once I'm there, like like quantum leap. Is proves. there any? Is there any ticking clock? You could take as long as you want. Oh. oh my god. Oh, dude. Then okay, if I go back to 1982, I number one. Uh, I go to uh, I go to the uh, 
to the elementary school where they had a, an entire computer lab of Apple IIe's. You know what? I probably spent like four or five years just getting access to computers, learning to code, and and oh my God, I just now realize I might never come back. I might just go back and know what's You would what's abandon possible. your wife and children. Yeah. Well, I could always go back whenever I want. But you literally you just said the, future, the opposite. Though, you do change the future. <laughs> you literally just said the opposite. You said I might never go back. Yeah, it would be weird for me to court somebody 30 years younger than me. Uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you never know. Things are weird. So Brian, this is, Brian this is, buys an island in the Caribbean. Yeah, this no, no, is, no, no, these, no. these oh, are, these okay, are oh, time oh. traveler rules, dude. Okay, but, but, but like what, what is the greater moral responsibility to, uh, to, to, to serve all of humanity and give up going back home? Or, or to you are just so excited to talk yourself into abandoning your wife and kids. Uh, you are just so pumped. You're just like, I, I have to. When you think about uh, no it, choice. the world needs uh, no me. Cho- I need to go back to my elementary school computer lab. I mean, this is this so is you can this learn is, to code. You this, can learn to code here. You can you can learn to code on an Apple Two GS yeah, right it's, now. It's too it's too late now. I, I, it's not too late. You okay, could do it right now. No, 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 no. It's too late for it to have a, a meaningful impact on on all of humanity. Uh, now, like, like, uh, what would yeah. you do? What would you do no, with that? No development and technology AI now is going to have a meaningful impact to humanity going forward. I'm look, I, 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 I this is a time travel question. Uh, how far back <laughs> you're do the you time go? travel equivalent of I'm gonna go buy a pack of smokes, I'll be right back, honey. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the uh, 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 the 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 question is, um, do I do I do a short hop and get material gain and take care of me and mine and then and have very little change? I might have been watching a lot of sliders lately. Uh, and, yeah. and uh, or is the question is is the my moral responsibility to humanity writ large, where I have the opportunity to, you know, for example, I don't know. Let's say I go to the late '80s and I know the uh, uh, Soviet Union is about to fall, uh, and so. I'm able to create peace initiatives that move earlier or invest in Microsoft or, 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 and then how long do I stay there? And, uh, and how close will things be? What, I assume I come back to the exact same time, right? Yeah. I I would I would do the cowardly thing. I would hop back. I would I would place like a few bets. You know what I do is I would hop back and I'd say, "Who wants a sexual favor for a hundred dollars?" What? And then I would give that sexual favor, and Bring, then I would buy a couple. Wait, you be buying, buying or providing? Uh, and then I would take the money I earned as fast as possible, and I would buy a complete set of Topps garbage pail kids, and I would bury them in a place that only I would know about. And then I would come back, and then oh, I, I, you wouldn't back to the future it and. Send Send it to yourself in the mail, and then when you come back, there'll be a guy saying, like, are you Brian Brushwood? And it's raining because it's dramatic. That's, that's that's pretty much what I'm describing. But but actually, uh, I would go back to 1993, and I would buy all the all of the Magic the Gathering cards I could, and I would collect as many Black Lotuses as I could, and then I would bury them in a secret place and immediately go back, and then that way the vast majority of my timeline and my life would be unaffected. My children would still be there, but then I would just be all like, who wants to go on a field trip? And then we'd you know go jogging out somewhere and, uh, and find just a whole bunch of... Three hundred thousand dollar a piece Black Lotuses first edition Wizards of the Coast. Uh, oh, Magic Brian, Gathering. I'm sorry. You just got back to your timeline. Yeah, everything screwed up. Well, I'm your friend Justin Robert Young, but uh, uh, I died, so I'm actually a ghost. I died because ev- the entire timeline got totally screwed up. What did you do? The last thing. That we saw was that you got in, that you you went time traveled. Now I'm dead. I'm a ghost. Ghosts are real, by the way. That also happened. But but like I'm able to talk to you. Yeah. Okay. I say, listen, we're going to go on the road. 
is going to be the most amazing. Nobody thing. else can see me. I, I, I so know. There's a real no. There's a but, real but, question but, but of whether like, or not I'm can, in your head. You, you can listen to what they're saying, and then you can whisper it to me. I, we can make money on this. No, I'm a ghost that you can't make money as a sideshow <laughs> attraction, which is your your oh, your response to every hypothetical situation. Sorry, it's an actual consequence, not one you can monetize. You screwed up everything because you hoarded all the Black Lotus cards. You want to know what happened? The nerds got mad. They, there weren't enough Black Lotus cards. The, the riot started and uh, uh, everything fell apart. What now? So, Do you go back and fix it? Oh, wait. Is that an option? I don't know. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> all out. Do you go back and fix it or not? I'm dead, by the way. I got killed by uh, uh, a, an errant binder in the nerd wars. <laughs> was was it Elisa Frank, Trapper Keeper? It, me, it hit me in the back of the head. I don't know. <laughs> but the last thing I saw was Fuchsia. Um, okay. Well, uh, if if history had changed, uh, do 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 I even remember you? What well, you do when you come back to see the horrible thing that you've done by affecting the timeline? Mm. Uh, I, I, I guess I can. I, I was gonna hurry up, but I guess I have all lifetime because I'm dead now. <laughs> well, okay. Well, yeah. I I hit the undo button. Hey, in your timeline. Well, what, what? Let me. Do you know who owns one of the Black Lotuses? Let me tell you how you could have screwed things up tremendously. All right. Post Malone. Oh no. Post there's Malone. A, there's a point. A despondent Post Malone couldn't buy a Black Lotus because it just wasn't available. And yeah. Then, you know. And he led. Yeah, so, he was. He was also did, did, a, a big key player of the Nerd Wars. Was is it? Is it used in near mint condition or no? It well, you buried it. You buried them all. Oh no, I'm talking about real life. Like, is there a real life chance that he has my black lotus? Oh no, he does. Uh -oh. I think he. Th there was a big deal where like uh, he put the word out during the pandemic when everybody was all card focused, and he wound up buying for some ridiculous amount of money a a black lotus card. I remember seeing a viral video where there was like a dude crying because he sold his Black Lotus card to Post Malone for some ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah. It, tur it turns out that earlier on, uh, there was the, the Wuhan lab safety officer had to leave early because he was going to, you know, the post office to go mail a Black yeah. Lotus card or something. Like, Brian caused the pandemic. Yep. yep. <laughs> I fill you in on all this like a uh, 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 Christmas Carol. I'm 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 a very expository ghost telling you all the things that happen. So I mean, number one, you have to dig up the black lotuses, or you have to go back in time. What do you do? I mean, but if I, if, if 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 I go back in time, I mm -hmm. get to try something else, right? I mean, you want to add? You want to bet more on this? You already screwed everything up. Well, okay. Civilization is decimated. Your partner is dead. Yeah. Hey, by the way, in uh, in in your original timeline, what what kind of stuff was I up to in uh, the fall of twenty twenty four? Oh, I oh oh, I see what you're doing. Uh, the uh, 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 what was I doing? I'm dead now, but what 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 would I have been doing in the fall of 2024? I mean, uh, well, we haven't gotten to the fall of 2024 yet, oh, so okay. who's to say what was happening though leading up to that? Uh, uh, you know, there was there was <laughs> there was a, a a presidential election that later would be called by historians the Battle of the Smugs <laughs> to see who could be. Uh, more unlikable to the other. Nothing else involving me specifically. Well, I, I, I mean, you're uh, <laughs> you're a ghost. I guess. Yeah, I know. I'm just war wondering what would have happened to my life. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the thing, Brian. In, you have in, to think in, about. Yeah, in late in August my, me, 2024, my, anything that yeah. was on my schedule in yeah, late in August 2024. Is, I know my no go zone is before is any point before my wife is born. Yeah. That's my, I won't go back further than that because I don't want to do anything to jeopardize my wife being born. That's mm. it. Anything after is fair game. 
I said, considering uh, the age gap doesn't give me a lot of room to work in. Well, I, I, <laughs> scalpel <laughs> precision, <laughs> scalpel moves. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. How would it make it much better if your wife was two years old when you went back for things? No, if my wife, if I go back before she's born, the butterfly effect, she may never be born. Yeah. But at least but she'll be born. After, after she's born, then at least I'm not erasing her from history. Like, yeah. hey, maybe we'll yeah. meet. Maybe we can do that. You know, she'd like be high school. Why is this creepy guy following? This creepy white guy following me? You know. Well, um, and and, and uh, to be honest, I have pretty much the same rule, but it's about um, uh, 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 co-creating uh, uh, the second time that we create a number one comedy album on the Billboard charts. So that I too have a very narrow. Good, good, good. Yeah. So for me, for me, logically thinking, my limit is before not going back before my wife is born. Cause I don't want to create a history where I realize that I erase her. Uh, I, I, to me it would be like, you know, give myself like envelopes with like, Hey, uh, I'm just some cool dude that vaguely looks like you, but I'm going to give you some advice. Here are a couple stock picks. Open up these envelopes. You can open up anytime, but this is when you need to buy. Yeah. Uh, and for the most part, I did, but not as much as I should have. <laughs> and so uh, I think you're doing okay, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, but you know, I you're doing still, all right. But I'd be stock picks. Like, well, here, no, here's what I would do I would be like, one is I'm going to give you these stock picks, but also listen, I want you in summer 2001 hang around, you know, that hookah bar you went to before. And I want you to start calling the FBI. You saw a lot of shady dudes talking about <laughs> flying planes. Okay. You know, uh, I want you to go there because the flight school's there. And like, I was like, you start, Call your dad, say, hey, listen, I saw these guys, they had weird accents, they're talking about flying planes, but something about buildings and not being able to land, I think they're going to a flight school here, make some noise about this, you know, uh, do what you can, because I think, you know, that was one of the problems is there was a lot of little symbols there, but hey, uh, call, my, well, you know, I, you back, I don't know if you know the backstory, but my dad uncovered back in the early 1980s, one of the first foreign uh, funding operations for domestic terrorism cells, you know, for so, and he went to the FBI, says, Hey, look, they're sending money over here. They're operating here. They're doing this. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what could come of what that? What could go Trade wrong? Center. Yeah. Uh, my dad's finally writing his stuff down because my dad's kind of the Forrest Gump of law enforcement. Um, so, uh, yeah, like literally, my, <laughs> my favorite thing about my dad is, you know, this the thing of like the, the guy hitting the little domino and the bigger domino and the bigger domino. Oh, sure. My dad arrests the guy who says, Hey, I can tell you how Manuel Noriega is bringing drugs into the country. <laughs> and so my dad turns him into a witness and he brings down the guy next to, you know, invasion of Panama. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, he's yeah. Uh, like he, he indicted the guy that tried to kill Bob Marley. I mean, like it's just crazy stuff. Like this, uh, the South Florida, early 80s, 80s, 90s was crazy. But anyhow, point is, I would uh, tell myself, here's the condition. You're going to have to get, you need to be very loud 2001 about, hey, there are some people from uh, Saudi Arabia, other countries coming in and studying how to fly airplanes. And they knew, that was one of the things too, is we knew that Al-Qaeda and we knew that terrorist groups had, they had a fixation on airplanes. We knew they had a fixation on the World Trade Center. There was a plot earlier, a few years before, to try to park a bunch of planes in the middle of the ocean. So I think if you just said, oh, I think I overheard this, whatever, go do that. Um Next, it'd be like, uh, I can't remember when the specifically when of the major tsunamis that hit South Pacific hit. So I feel horrible about that. I mean, I could save lives. And the next one would be, you know, use that money I've made to all of a sudden raise, hey, do we know what's going on in labs? Are we sure about this lab research stuff? Let's look at things like EcoHealth Alliance. Let's really, you know, try to prevent the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, I think that's probably the better uh the 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 thing that's most front of mind right now, right? Is like how would you go back in time and prevent the pandemic? Or at least yeah. try to mitigate it on on some level. Uh Yeah, and and cuz yeah, I mean, because you, cause, cause you, the, the the pandemic would have been a lot different if we knew exactly let's we're presuming right now for the for the 
for this time travel scenario that this was indeed leaked from a lab. But the pandemic would have been a lot different if we knew exactly what that strain was that uh, that leaked from the lab like immediately, right? The well, the the, the challenge was, you know, well, well we. We did know, <laughs> but uh, it, it, yeah, the challenge would be if it was zoonotic, which again, there is a possibility it's still, and there's just this. But in this science, in this latest. science fiction scenario, it is, it is. Yeah, not. I, the latest document stuff now, the latest stuff coming out, like I, I, it's really hard to hold on to the zoonotic explanation. It really, exactly, really is. which is it, why we're getting possible, in the anyway. time travel machine. Yeah, but I would say that, like, yeah, that would be a thing. Like, if you could prevent the pandemic, that would be great. How would you do that? You know. um, uh, and that would be if, like, if you had the money, then you could, you could, you know, so here's the thing is like, I'm going to fund a research lab <laughs> to prevent this. Yeah. And then I find out that they're working on some other crazier virus. So what, what would you do? Do you die. like, is it arson? Do you just, you know, or, or is it, is it just, uh, uh, how, how would, how would you even go about doing something like that? Well, the, just pour, pour I all think, the samples down the toilet. The toilet. Well, you want you 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 want awareness. You want people to be saying, "Hey, like, look at uh, you know, uh, look at what's going on. Let's pay attention to this. You know, are 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 we more likely to create a problem from this? Let's look at how we're funding last stuff like this. Uh, you know, look at mRNA. Like, maybe the thing is like let's accelerate mRNA research. If you're like, I don't know if I can prevent this, but like, we're in a much better position now because of that." You know, that's the thing is like the, the, no matter how much we screwed things up and, and and we can't bring back the people that passed away in theory, 10 years from now, we'll be better equipped in theory for a pandemic. Although I just hope that it's not another loud leak. Um, uh, so, yeah, I guess yeah, that would be my question is like, is it. Is it preventable through people knowing things? And also, how do you come from the future knowing uh, uh, everything that's going to happen and then try to raise awareness for it without just sounding like Alex Jones, which raises the other question, is Alex Jones a time traveler? Yeah. Uh, gambling man, uh, I know a guy that bought in, bought in video four years ago. <laughs> uh, but I would say, too, that it becomes a helpful sort of thing to think what kinds of information are valuable to you. Like for Brian, you know, Brian is his understanding, look at the games, look at things like this to say, like, what's going to get what's going to increase in value. And and that's why some people build prediction markets and some people, you know, do really well. You know, Warren Buffett sits there and looks at these companies and says, what are the clues that these things can become more valuable? Uh, there was a paper that just came out where they compared GPT-4 to humans when it came to financial analysis. And GPT-4 outperformed people, even when you just gave it company financial statements. Damn. So not even like like training a specific model, just gave chat GPT-4 mm -hmm. the, the, the finance stuff. Yeah, and that tells you, it, and I think that, that to me, that's a super, super profound realization because we, we often say, well, markets are gambling. It's just what well, it is. There are certain things you can't control to an extent, but, you know, the, some casinos have better odds than others. And so and and sometimes you can have you can be the casino. And so this is a situation where clearly there is enough signal out there to make better decisions. It's not all luck that there, there is. There is bad decisions. There's really good. There's lucky decisions and there can be better informed decisions. And I think that's the thing that if you think about going like looking now at the present, like, well, I don't have a time machine. But what would I do? Well, I would I would make decisions based upon information. But if you go back and you look, if you go if you go look backwards and you say, what what would have been a clue? You know, like like you know what would have been a clue? You know, five years ago to buy Nvidia, and you know the the one is that every new AI was getting bigger, gaming is getting bigger, GPUs were behind everything, and you could kind of say, well, if I'm a time traveler from ten, what I think the world's going to be like ten years from now, what should that person be telling me? Yeah. And, you know, uh, one of the, the the perennial things that we know increases in value for the most part is real estate. Um, but with dot, dot, dot exception, where where have real estate values been plummeting? Uh, on the moon. <laughs> uh, rural Japan. Ah, why? No people. Oh, because of population decline. Yep. There, there are large areas there with just empty houses because nobody's living there. So, you know, that's the kind of thing to say, like, okay, uh, 
you know, how do, how do you factor these things in? But do, uh, I, don't, I love do, the time. Do you think there's an opportunity in a world where, like, like here in America, you know, people love van life, they love uh, camping and all that stuff. Uh, uh, also, there's a lot of Westerners who love uh, Japan. Uh, I, I'd be surprised if I, I believe Japan has fairly strict um, regulations on who's allowed to move in and live in Japan, but seems to me like that'd be a pretty good market. You know, a bunch of, bunch of vloggers, you know, with their Starlinks and their solar panels out in rural Japan, just talking about the fabulous rural Japan lifestyle. Yeah. But I mean, when I was in Japan was living there, there was the, the emperor had his DNA tested and found out Shocking Korean ancestry because who colonized the you know Japan islands after the indigenous people was Koreans, but uh, the major newspapers there wouldn't cover it. They refused to print because he was trying to do a unification with with Korea and wanted to bridge the alliance there. But the nationalism for Japan was so strong they didn't want to disclose that their emperor had you know really heavy Korean ancestry, and that's the problem. That's that that is. You know, while they they like tourism in certain areas and stuff like that, but beyond that, they're not really saying "come move here." <laughs> you know, come All live right. here. Or... I got million, a hundred million dollar idea right here. I'm gonna drop rural Japan, Margaritaville retirement community. Both, right. both. <laughs> uh, pronounced uh, Margarita. They're Bill. all gonna love. Everyone's gonna love it. Westerners will love it. Japanese people will love it. Margaritaville, retirement community. Karaoke. Boom. Oh, of course. Of course, karaoke. Japanese people love karaoke. Well, I, and, and to that point, um, you could have, you know, uh, you certainly have, look at New Zealand, like the attraction for New Zealand, right, of where, you know, where are people, you know, they're buying property up there, down there, whatever, you know, they're for their bunkers, et cetera. You could certainly say like, oh, well, that's kind of, you know, you, you know, is that a thing that Japan does? Japan, but Japan is so protective of their cultural identity and New Zealand's getting that way too. Yeah. Well, we're getting protective about patreon.com slash weird things. Thank you to everybody who supports this show at patreon.com slash weird things. We, uh, we love you. We love you all. Joe, uh, I want to show you. Oh, oh sorry. I, I, uh, uh, we could take as long or as little on this as as we feel informed about it. But what up with North Korea just sending their trash down to South South Korea? Like, I guess, I guess they're that's the new version of of <laughs> of of like lousy neighbors is like. Uh, you keep sending your propaganda up at us. We're gonna send you our poop and old shoes. Wait, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, really? No, Andrew. Yeah, I, I followed the the broad strokes of this. And, uh, 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 basically, North Korea has sent thousands and thousands of balloons fill, uh, uh, attached to garbage bags, and they're all like, "Yo, it's messed up." South Korea, that you keep sending us pamphlets with all of your propaganda. So to let you know what it feels like, we're sending you our garbage, and maybe you can appreciate how hard it is to clean up all this garbage. And then they just literally have sent hundreds of balloons of garbage across the border. And it, it is a, a specific retaliatory measure for uh, uh, pamphlets? Uh or yes. is that just a general like do, do I guess my question would be do we have any sense that they're doing it for any reason other than that or is this a direct one for one tit for tat? Uh okay, here we go. Here's I, I just typed in North Korea garbage balloons and here's uh just a random thing I'm gonna North Korean on. garbage balloons <laughs> floating <laughs> over the they parallel. Don't like it. Please don't send your garbage down. Here's some of our own used condoms. Just kidding. We don't allow those. What's up with us? Uh, oh, there's no video. Okay. Well, that was a good idea for a segment. <laughs> I I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> uh, wait, wait here. I, I want, uh, Brian, I want you to do an experiment. You ready? 
Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I, I do have something. Got it. Go. No, go for it. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. All right. Here we go. To Korea now. The South Korean government today issuing an emergency air raid warning, not about bombs or missiles, but about balloons. Hundreds of balloons that floated over the border from North Korea overnight. You see them here, filled with things like trash and animal feces, old batteries too, propaganda leaflets. South Korea is telling people, obviously, don't touch the balloons, report them to official. And what is just the latest in this years long fight between North and South Korea? NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald is joining years us now. Long. This battle of the balloons is happening in a pretty, um, pretty noteworthy way. Trash, manure basically coming across. Why? Why now? Yeah. Yeah, a really bizarre tactic, to say the least. So a few weeks ago, in early May, a North Korean defector who turned into this human rights activist launched some 20 balloons carrying hundreds of thousands of leaflets condemning Is North Korean leader Canadian Kim Jong-un. So the then, he's on this defector. warning from... Uh, I, I, I think uh, they meant defector. <laughs> they said the word defector. Manure, yeah. yeah, in manure. Yeah. North Korea's vice defense minister of this tit-for-tat action that was coming, and sure enough... That's exactly what we saw today. Some 200 balloons raining down over South Korea, filled with everything from trash, fertilizer, leaflets. Uh, yes, you just said all of that. Anyway, they're throwing, they're throwing garbage across the neighbor's so fence. This, okay, yeah. So this is a specific because, like, like when, when when you first mentioned it, I didn't know if it was some kind of like, oh, North Korea just has a lot of trash and they want to and they they need a, a reason to get rid of it. This would seem to be yeah. a particularly inefficient way to do it but you never know with those guys uh but no this is there was an activist who was doing a thing that was that really po'd the north koreans and so now they're like well i'll show you here's some garbage yeah pretty much yay cool all right brian i sent you two emails ignore the first one okay okay as i, as I do <laughs> uh look at the second one says code yep okay uh, i got it I opened it. I want you. You're gonna feel like God. You ready for okay, this? Okay, I'm ready. I'm I'm gonna copy this thing, and then I'm gonna okay, paste it. Okay, you're gonna it go to code. Thing. Yeah, go to codepen.io. Codepen.io. Yep. Pen. Oh, io. Yep. Yep. Okay, yep. Click start coding. And where where do I paste it? On the left. On the left. Start coding. Start coding. I'm gonna I'm gonna code. I'm gonna I'm gonna paste, paste this in the HTML. HTML. Okay, got, got it. Uh, Click in the window. Now, look at that code. There's only 256 yeah. characters. 256 Audio characters. Audio listeners, uh, it says uh, uh, open carrot canvas style equals width 99%, ID equals C, one on click, blah, 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 blah. Bunch of numbers, bunch of X's, Y's, Z's, all of your letters, and then things. All right, now what? Two, cl 256 characters. Uh, click in the window, click in the white area. In, in the white area? See that big white space, Brian? Oh, down here. Yeah. Okay. Well, now oh, make it bigger. Like if you can, you can actually go to the top of the window and raise the type top of it. Like you can just that. Yeah. This looks as though we have just procedurally generated a parallax 3D implied pixel art version of what I assume is an infinite scroll of a procedurally generated skyline of an infinite downtown yep uh it's all black and white it's got it's got volumetric shading uh to to imply depth of field in the fog uh picture like it's already better than minecraft <laughs> just just that code looks better than minecraft that's wild Th that is a ray tracer in 256 bytes that's amazing it is there, there's a website which i sent you the first link where the guy who made it breaks it down calls it city in the bottle and breaks down it's actually it's even better when you zoom out or make it smaller like if you click on the other link you'll see it embedded in uh a a, a twitter link oh the, uh the other link being uh, in, my in the email, email the first okay. email yeah, yeah. that you ignored as you were wont to do it doesn't want to do as I was. You struck. made that joke. I was repeating your joke. Uh, oh, good point. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. I'll allow it. Uh, so, so, so can we enhance the level of yeah. fidelity? That looks amazing. 
And that is so what what what, what small code to do it as it is just generatively being created. What yeah uh, uh, uh real quick so is, what it, is this a different language that we're unfamiliar with for coding or No, it's it's just pure it's just javascript. Uh it's just a 199 byte payload of javascript embedded in a canvas element. If you go down and you scroll down on that page one of the things that's interesting is you'll you'll see that what they're doing is creating a background gradient. The the cities, if you scroll down further, you'll see these this uh keep going. You'll see keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Keep, stop. Okay, to go back. That that is a top-down view of what the skyscrapers and buildings are. So it's basically creating this sort of uh map that is a, a color of like different varying you know you know intensities like from white to black which is going to be the heights of the buildings and so it creates these city these buildings the buildings are basically saying if it's really you know really dark and make it very high really light it's going to be flat so it's creating these different extrusions using that you know building heights via grayscale and then they have a fog element and he just breaks down this is frankforce.com city in a bottle and breaks down how how all these things are procedurally generated by just a few bits of code and able to create what looks like a you know 3D view of a city and they're literally it's doing light tracing it's basically predicting you know what the camera is getting what what photons would hit the camera what's going to be visible what's not by basically just saying you know what if we send light through here what happens now 256 bytes is is this a case where the uh the code could be so short because the processing power expected is so high. Like for example, um, uh, you know, like uh, when I was playing Karatika on the Apple IIe uh, uh, 40 years ago, um, how, how uh, that, that, that probably required a lot more code than we just saw, but the processing power wasn't great enough. It had to just say, okay, just here's a picture of what, the clouds look like in the background run with that don't generate it on the fly like how how much is the trade off between the length of code and uh, uh the the, the um, live rendering the, the nine you see there is the time element it's not a huge amount here like because it, it it is doing you know it is i mean i would it, it's not it's something you could do this you could do this on a 15 year old machine it'd be fine you know, so it's not so much that it's just, I mean, one, JavaScript engines have become much more efficient over time, you know, because we use them, in, you know, Java's for, you know, running just about everything, you know, we in the front end. So, and also back end now with Node. So that becomes kind of part of it. So there is this really cool, like, demo scene thing. If you go look down on the bottom, uh, there is a thing that's a colored city. Yep. And that's like a super simple code. Like, if you click on... Uh, that go above where it says the uh, the D Twitter, okay, right right below the image. Oh, below the image. Sorry. Well, that's that, yeah, but yeah, this is another version. So, uh, I I I wonder if we need to remind people of what the whole demo scene was like in an era still of the, around, still around. Uh, but 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 the the very very early days I saw of it was in you know proto internet where on less than one floppy disk drive you would get these incredible uh you know quite literally just demonstrations of like uh, uh, how do you make a, a a whirlpool appear with pixels and how do you play midi music that that you know allows a 16 year old to you know make a techno jam and so on uh, but yeah but, it's but the in- game was always to see how small you could pack everything yeah, and, and that's it's exciting to see that people still do that, that they're still playing around with that. And, you know, this the city in a bottle is just a great example of that because it's just and, – and I brought that up. When we look at these systems like GPT-4, these really advanced AI systems, that inside of them they're able to figure out things and do calculations and stuff, this is what 256 characters can do. It can create a physics simulator with light ray tracing. What do you do when you have, you know, 100 billion, you know, 1 trillion parameter models – what are they capable of doing in there? You know, I, I was at a meeting the other day and they're asking like, what's the point of Sora, the OpenAI image video generator? Like, seems like a gimmick. I'm like, it's not Netflix. 
it's physics. You know, it's a simulator. It's, yeah. it's a thing for predicting things of, of that. And that that's the really exciting part is once you get past that it's, it's a pretty image and think, oh, it can predict what happens when you drop a bottle or, you know, drop a thing or something goes through the air. Oh, well, well, I'm for it. Yeah. So just very, very cool to see what you can do with a very little amount of code. But by the way, I want you to know, Andrew, this is the sound of Brian just resisting the urge to spend the next one hour on the live stream playing old demos that he remembers from 30 years ago. So. Oh, I know. Well, I just loaded up Demo Scene 2023 here to see what was in there. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, there go okay, maybe, maybe do we have any picks <laughs> okay <laughs> my pick is uh my third lap on fallout uh first time i watched it i thought it was great second time i was like maybe it's not great third time i watched it i'm like no it's great yeah i finished it it's okay Bye. Bye. Like not that. impressed it, it didn't some some of the characters grabbed me more than others and i i was not i was not blown away by any any of the journeys aside from the stuff actually in the shelter the stuff actually in the shelter i think i loved the most and the stuff topside i was uh hit or miss on well i can't wait to find out what amazing viewing list you have that is so much better than fallout justin i'm glad you asked mr main because I have been enjoying the Netflix series Ripley, uh, based on the uh, uh, talented Miss Ripley book. Uh, it is very pretentious. <laughs> it's in black and white. Uh, but if you've ever really wanted a stylized look at how a sociopath operates in real time, uh, in the gorgeous environs of 1950s Italy. Uh, boy, is it there for you. Uh, I've been, I've been enjoying it. It's been too slow for Ashley, but uh, uh, I've liked it. I mean, the, the acting's really good, and it's shot just incredibly cinematically. It's one of those shows where you're just kind of shocked that it's on television. And I think it stands out even more because television has looked kind of cheaper and cheaper. Uh, especially in the boom of a few years ago where there was like 600 new shows. There's only, you know, like uh, so many great artisans in that craft, but uh, uh, the Ripley show just looks next level. Amazing. It's interesting that the Ripley has been adapted like half a dozen times into films. Yeah. And it, other than the talented Mr. Ripley, Matt Damon, it's kind of gone so kind of below the radar. Uh, first adaptation was like 1959. And then you've had like, I think, let's go pull up here. Um, you had Ripley Underground with Barry Pepper, Ripley's Game, which was The American Friend with Dennis Hopper. Then you had John Malkovich play this. Uh, it's just been multiple cases. And, and uh, so now that you've seen that, and the, and the comparison I've made that I've never really heard made very loudly, but I think is very clear. Did you, did you read the later Hannibal Lecter novels? No. Hannibal or anything like that. Uh, but even if you saw the movie where he goes to Europe. Yes. Uh, it's very much Ripley. Inspired very, 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 by. Very, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very much that. And I think that was part of the challenge for the character was Ripley was written as this. He was a killer by convenience he had the things he wanted and if you were in his way and that's very would... much how this is played this is played yeah. that he is he is a maybe slightly above intelligence con man but he is very confident in the moment uh he definitely has more of a read on people than the average bear but he's not a mastermind and and that's something where it's like this this show very much takes its cues from a lot of the suspense genre of like Breaking Bad and the Americans and stuff like that, uh, Ozark. But in those, the 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 creeping, the power creep of those characters is that they kind of have to become 
smarter or more intelligent or more uh, uh, they have to have more guile because when you're running them into these brick walls so often, they just have to kind of become better and more capable. Whereas this story obviously laid out from a long time ago, uh, he's he's played as, you know, he's he's a con man, but uh, he definitely just doesn't want to go to jail and is willing to kill the guy in front of them, uh, in front of him if it means he doesn't go to jail, which. Brings him, of course, closer to jail. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to watching that. I've enjoyed the character. I think it's it's a really well-drawn sort of depiction of, you know, a, a interesting villain. Yeah, yeah. And obviously it's an anti-hero kind of uh, a protagonist where that has kind of come in and out of favor and, and certainly in that suspense genre. I can understand in a post- Breaking Bad, Americans, Ozark world, where it's like, oh, let's just do a a version of Ripley, and and they do. Uh, Ripley is played by the guy who was um, Moriarty in the Sherlock Holmes, the newer Sherlock Holmes Netflix series, and uh, I think his his uncanny ability to uh, uh, just be kind of weird while smiling is uh, is very well put into play here. Yeah, uh, Andrew Scott. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He's great, great, great in this role. And again, the the cinematography on it is just next level, like cinema quality cinematography. That's great. Uh, so whose turn is it? Yours, now? my turn. Yeah. So I have a, a two picks, a repick, and then a new pick. Uh, my repick is just watch severance all the way through again and come back severance come back baby finish shooting you know could have an air date later this year we'll see uh loved it loved it loved it loved it and uh i think i talked talk about last week being making my way through it and now finished it and very excited about the idea of a new season i think it's a great it's one of my favorite science fiction shows like that and devs because it takes one idea one idea that the idea the, the you know the you know spoiler alert uh, first five minutes alert uh, you know <laughs> the idea that you can put a chip in your head and go into a workplace and have a completely different life than outside of there and the two being very separated and that what does that mean like that's an idea that can just keep being interesting to say if this is true what else is true if this is true what else is true so I love that I love science fiction ideas where they can tell you they can see it up front. Yeah, and I love the very beginning because it is very mysterious and whatnot. What, and then you go, oh, shoot, that's really cool. And I may have ruined it for people. I apologize. So many now, cool you're... elements of that. That world just kept getting more interesting, and and that is that is so, I think, oftentimes taken for granted, especially in our IP driven world, where giving you a thing that is familiar is often more important to the creation than giving you something that's interesting. And that's what makes something like severance i think stand out so well is that every little time that you go around a corner there's something just a little weird something a little mm -hmm. fun yeah my pick is i'm actually in the middle of watching this right now this is a youtuber named paper will and he did a video that's like two years old now called entertainment made by cults oh that's great that's so it's, great. it's a, a great overview of all these crazy things including uh showing a uh jazz album l ron hubbard did with you know the guy says this song is really really good and some other stuff not so good uh just a lot of crazy stuff that different cult groups have made and they show the the om shri ru cult these were the ones that did the sarin gas attack in tokyo mm -hmm. and killed like 10 people they wanted to kill more but they show before that happened the the uh anime made of the leader you know oh, showing geez. how he could fly and all this and it's kind of it's hilarious and then sad because you're like while they're working on this they're planning gas to you know to kill, kill in in the tokyo subway uh speaking of youtube yeah. essays uh andrew or brian have you guys watched the 
uh, now infamous Jenny Nicholson four hour review of the Star Wars Hotel? I believe I made it 48 minutes in, and uh, that took two nights. I fell asleep both times. Sounds well, like sounds like it was a bad theme park, Justin. Oh God, I couldn't get enough of it. Andrew, did you watch any of it? No, not yet. I had friends that gave me their personal takes on it, but I'm curious what your takeaways were from this. Uh, of of the review or or takes of the of the Star Wars of Hotel. the review. Yeah, I thought it was very fair. <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah. I think that it was. Uh, you know, the, the the top line is that it was very disappointing. It was really uh, uh, not only was it exceptionally expensive, but uh, there were a lot of design decisions that were curious and, and almost designed to fail. And her point of view, which is, I think consistent with a lot of her criticism of, of the modern Disney theme parks, is that it's not only cost cutty and not only um, trying to maximize what they can squeeze out of guests, but uh, that... It's cost cutty in dumb ways, in ways that didn't need to be uh, be like that. And uh, uh, I was shocked, considering I, I'm a huge fan of immersive theater, uh, that they decided to gamify it almost like an RPG in a way that is just destined to fail. Like, the the the... the, the the way of doing that, at, and instead of just doing a an immersive theater where there's just characters that are constantly kind of moving from place to place, they would usually happen probably during dinner or something like that, and then having these like moments of theatricality, they you know had you 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 being you talking to them would create a score, so you would pair with people, you were texting with them or at least they're bots on an app and they would give you things, but uh, uh, it, I don't know. I, I was, I was, I could not get enough of watching what an absolute failure that, that was and, and the reasons why, because I think it's very consistent with a lot of the criticisms of, uh, you know, the last 15 years of Disney theme parks. I, you know, I have some inside info on some of the stuff that went in there and I have never, I haven't been to a Disney park. Like even though I lived in Burbank, I hadn't been to Disney. I didn't go after Galaxy's Edge. I never, never went to Galaxy's Edge. I was so disappointed in what they had done. And, and from the point of view of that, uh, a, an attraction designed to get the full experience that a family of four is going to have to spend like close to a thousand dollars on top of their tickets yeah. or whatever, like just seemed gross to me. Like I just, just was frustrated by that, that idea that, I, I get, you know, it's a business. I understand that. But like, I'm, you know, I'm a guy that will say, give, what's the best experience? Fine. Here's my card. I'll pay for it to go do it. And I looked at that and I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't want to do it. Um, and there is some Disney has said that their numbers like, oh, we're doing we're doing great attendance numbers. But they never said what those numbers actually were before. Disney's actually not doing as great. From you know they're doing money wise they're making money but for attendance wise attendance wise gone down and part of it is I think is things like this the Galaxy's Edge when that opened that was a complete surprise to a lot of people at Disney and that was sort of like a much smaller thing uh, just a lot of just thinking that goes in there there was you know a lot of attention was put into the Shanghai parks and things like that which I don't think was a wise choice because I think that you know a lot of companies bought into the the you know the 21st century being the Chinese century which knows kind of probably not going to happen given their population growth and whatnot and cracking down and whatnot. So, you know, I think it caught, there was a lot of cost there, you know, I'm still hopeful, still hopeful, but yeah, I wish I, I, it, I think but what, one of the biggest takeaways is that that structure that they built, it's going to be hard to even repurpose that, you know, her, her best guess of somebody who used to work in the parks is that it might just be a place for corporate meetings or anything but it's not like it's easy to turn over and turn it into a restaurant or something like that because it's not connected to anything you had to take a van out to go uh uh wait in it but i, I don't know if you're if you're into park design and attraction design and immersive theater uh i would i would highly recommend it it's four hours so it'll take you it'll take you a little bit but l luckily i had a I had a a, a flight, a, that, a, a fast pass. 
but yeah, you can uh, you can you can you can get through it. It's I I I, I like Jenny Nicholson's point of view on stuff because I never I always think that she's rooting for the uh, for the thing to be good, um, and when it's not, she's not uh, uh, you know there to to relish in it being bad. It's just you got to be honest with the audience. Which yeah, I I you know I I wanted it to be cool, but I mean my my crit was. The most exciting thing about Star Wars isn't sitting on a ship going from point to point. It is the places you go to. And and that was a thing that when they said it's set, you know, set in the Star like, cool, where are you gonna go? The Galaxy's Edge, the thing that everybody there had already been to. Like, yeah. Like you're not like like and, and my pitch was if you'd given me the same amount of space and budget, I would have done an Indiana Jones hotel and you would have visited a couple archaeological sites and there'd be things that would unfold there, which I think would have been really cool, but they didn't call me. They didn't ask me. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, Epic Universe. That's the new Universal Park, right? Have you Have you seen what's going on up there? Uh, I have not. No, aside from the from the initial renderings. Uh, so they've been unveiling more parts of it. There's going to be a whole new Harry Potter land there. Um, and if you start looking at the the images coming through there and some of the things they've revealed, like it'll be the biggest Nintendo world we've seen so far, but they're going to have all these different lands. Like if the, the dark universe, which is the whole, like, you know, DC dark universe, like Frankenstein's California, Cal, you know, and then the the wizard world of how Harry Potter ministry of magic, like that looks, looks kind of awesome. Yeah. I mean, Islands of Adventure was the, the 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 theme park of my formative years. I I'm 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 excited to uh, to take my uh, my child that Brian would have yeah. casually uh, thrown into the uh, into the ether for, yeah. for the sake the of burying a few black lotuses. Well, remember Brian Brushwood, the guy that we said, "What's the first thing you do when there's an apocalypse?" Is take off his pants. There we go. There we go. Although that was an old Brian Brushwood. That was a Brian Brushwood before he has he had seven acres. You know, now oh, now sure. I'm sure that's just five o'clock, man. I mean, yeah, exactly. It, it, it is kind of like, you know, uh, day class A at this point. Yeah. Yeah. He's 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 uh 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 I'm just gonna say grass has been growing a little tall out here and there's more than one snake slithering around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Epic Universe, one more thing, they're gonna have the Donkey Kong cart ride. Awesome. Awesome. It's been weird. <laughs> Andrew Scott will be at Knives Out 3. Yay. <laughs> free, yeah, free Ryan Johnson from the Knives Out. I think I'm not, I, I think I'm knived out. I'm knived out when it comes to Knives Out. I, I was knived out 10 minutes into the first yeah. one. <laughs> Uh, are, are we, uh, do we have a, an after things in us or do we, do we want to roll on out? What, what are we feeling? I got one. I got one. I got after things. All right. All right. You ready? Yep. All right. Hold on. Here you go. Three, two. Hello and welcome to the after things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Uh, hi. And Justin Robert Young. Psh, psh, psh. Hello. I was thinking about this today because I said, you know, it's kind of cool. I, my wife showed me this uh, Instagram account of these high school students that bought a school bus. And they're basically refitting it to be able to go on a tour, putting in bunk beds, painting it, all that. And they have a channel that's not got that's something like 2 million viewers. And their plan is to go cross country. And and you go like, why do they have two million viewers? Because there are a bunch of high school kids taking a trip, and it's there's a lot that goes into the psychology of that. But there's kind of the kind of a big lesson there. And if you go back to Ben Franklin, do you remember? Uh, I'm sure you guys remember this. Like Ben Franklin talked had the Juntu Club, J U N T O. I do not know or the this, leather no. apron club. Yeah, so, I, I, I'm unfamiliar. I will, as I say, you'll remember this, Franklin was a guy at an early age was determined to be prosperous, right? You know, 
put into indentureship to his brother, which he then broke. That's fine. Uh, first chance he had to go cross the ocean to go visit England. He did, came back, and did not have, was not a man of means, but was very, very dedicated to the idea of becoming prosperous. And he was a very good observationist. And he got to with a group of his friends and said, let's let's work together. If if I need, you know, if I need carpentry, I'm gonna go to you. If I need this, I'm gonna go to you. We'll we'll help each other out, we'll use each other, we'll build up our little businesses by relying upon each other. And also the idea of basically like let's 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 use our capabilities to sort of, you know, help each other out. And to, you know, they discuss politics, they discuss morality, philosophy, etc. And Franklin would make a habit if he said, you know. If I carry a wheelbarrow full of stuff from point A to point B, people are going to see me doing something. I'm going to be industrious looking. And that's a thing that I think that we pick up on is when Justin and I were, I came up, this was a really weird thing. I remember like Justin and I used to deal with this plastic shop because we used to have like special plastic parts made for a magic prop. And we would deal with printers and other people. People liked us, maybe, maybe more Justin than me, but people liked us <laughs> because we were, two scrappy guys out there with a business building stuff. We were out there doing things and that's attractive. That's interesting because, you know, we watch shows how it's made and we see people, a group of people working on a thing, doing a thing. It's interesting. And that was something Ben Franklin realized like, Oh, if, if me and my friends were always doing stuff and we're supporting each other, that becomes attractive to other people because you're like, well, they must know something. Clearly there's value there. So industriousness is something that the more the, you know, the, the, what you both have said, the internet smells effort and that's the same sort of thing. And that if you're out there doing things, that's different than sitting there planning things. It's different than having ideas about things. I've been spending more time with, with venture capital firms and people and talking to them and, and advising and whatnot and seeing what do they pick up on and ideas. They come across great ideas all day long. I, ideas are cheap. Ideas are everywhere. They look for, people who they think are good founders and founders are industrious. Often it's teams, groups of people building things or doing things. And if you can't play well with others, you're, it's, it's a good, it's a pretty good indicator. You're not going to build a good company because, you know, building a company means playing well with others. If you can work well with others, then that's a good sign. And if you can stay focused on a thing and that's a good sign. So that's my takeaway is be industrious, cooperate, build things. Yeah. You know, it's, I wonder whether or not we are are in a waxing or waning of those kind of lessons with the internet. Because on one hand, you you can be more isolated than ever with the people that you would naturally connect with and that are the easiest to kind of connect to, especially in learning that lesson of uh, being able to play well with others. But at the same time, you can connect with so many more people in so many more areas. And so maybe we are just building it in in different planes of existence that... You can assemble a team. You can find a group of people. You can say, oh, my God, I love this on Twitter. And now all of a sudden you have a friend that you can march forward with. And that's I know happened to me with the political realm. A lot of the people that I know were just people that I've run into on the Internet and said, hey, yo, dog, like your stuff. And now, you know, almost like by accident, we're we're now best friends and they're going to come like stay over at my house while they're while they're working on something or uh, uh, you know, when I'm in DC, I just have people that I'm going to go talk to that are plugged into things. Uh, there's, I, 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 I wonder, I, I wonder about where, where that lesson is. Are, are we moving into a more communal phase or are we moving into a more individualist phase? I, y even you take somebody like Mr. Beast, who's an incredibly successful YouTuber, his channel would be boring if it wasn't him and his buddies. Yeah. And, and you watch, you know, you watch somebody too, the, the guy that, you know, keep, you know, the repeat, I've heard his name, who repeatedly failed to win the million and a half million dollar prize, then shows up as one of the other guys, you know, on an adventure and on a thing. And I think that's part of the attraction of that part of the attraction of diamond club was, you know, you and Brian teaming up with Tom and others and saying, Hey, we like each other's work. We're, yeah. we're, we're going to support each other. It doesn't have to be, an official corporation or company. It just has to be, we're mutual fans and we have platforms and we can share each other's platforms. Kind of like, you know, music and rap, you know, kind of like that where it's like, Oh, I like come do a thing on my album. I'll go do a thing on yours. And I think that's, 
that is a, a, a way that we see it manifested now. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I wonder if it hasn't always been that way, just, um, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, we, we could trace more of the threads of it uh, over time. I mean, I don't know, I've, I've been listening to all of the think pieces about rap beefs, and it's all about who knew when, when, and when. And it's just that it's, uh, I suspect that unlike the rap beefs of the early days, just the the time and the precision with which you can trace all of the, um, uh, and this is antithetical to your point of, you know, you're talking about a positive, uh, chain, uh, uh, the negative chain is certainly accelerated and can be broken down faster. But, but I, I think you're correct that the positive chain also is accelerated and can be, uh, uh tracked better. Well, it, in the, I mean, the takeaways I think is that, you know, one of uh, uh, one of the people we know, he had a podcast and it was a fan cast. And I was talking to him about advertising and he said, well, the problem is, is I don't have enough of an audience to do this. I said, yeah, but you have a bunch of buddies that do the, the same fan genre. He's like, yeah. I said, just get them all to agree that you're a syndicate and then go to an advertiser. They went and they got a big advertiser because he said, oh, yeah, like we can. I'm, I'm only this on this, but five people together yeah. is a lot. And, and that's the thing that, that you know, it's, it's nothing new. It's, you know, the, the, the Greeks philosophical schools, the first tribes, all this just comes to like a, a, two people going, yeah, let's work together. And then three people work together. And, you know, a small group working together against a mob that's not working together, the small group's going to win out overall and sometimes negatively so. You know, that's how certain, you know, uh, countries get taken over, you know, well, can happen and, and that so, way. So along those lines, uh, in as universal terms as we can manufacture, uh, what, what is your advice to, uh, take advantage of that natural impulse, that natural effect? I, I think the thing is to look at ways, you know, that you can, if you, you don't have to be alone. It doesn't mean you have to all of a sudden be part of a company or do something like that you can create opportunities for things like that. I've watched people get other people together by first saying, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I was at a dinner last night and it was by somebody I'd worked with at OpenAI and he was going to be in town and he brought in, he's at Google now, but he also works with venture funds. And he called up a bunch of people he knew and said, hey, let's get together and we'll have this venture fund. We'll pay the bill. <laughs> and we had a great dinner and talked and networked. And it was a thing that something came out of nothing where you got to talk to other people there and find out what they're up to and connect. You know, I, I connected with people that were working on stuff where I knew they needed help with prompt design and things like that. So you can be an organizer and you can create opportunities by that. And sometimes those can be there can be a lot of business just in being at that nexus point for stuff. But there can be opportunities that come out of that. And so I think the takeaway is to say if there's a thing you're into and you don't know where to go. Find other people that are into it. Meet on a regular basis. I meet every week. I've been meeting every week for four years with people who've been playing around with the the you know AI technology, OpenAI, and others. And every Thursday, we get together and talk and compare notes. And my skills have gone up tremendously from that. A um, couple times we've worked on each other with each other, maybe trying to help each other out with companies and stuff. But for the most part, as an information exchange, it's been phenomenal. It's how I feel up to date about things. Is because. I've got six other people following stuff. And once a week I sit down with them and talk to them about what's going on. You will never regret being in the center of, 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 of a community that's working on stuff. It's just, it's very, very, very rarely a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. I watched uh, a guy named Cosmo Sharf. He helped organize um, the co-founder of VRLA, which was a, big uh be, became a very big you know event for virtual reality in los angeles and i think i went to the first one you know was you know at the space i think of some i forget which company was at and then it started to grow to take up entire you know entire like you know wing of a convention hall and he's gone off to go do other vr companies and do other things and you know he's become uh you know very connected in the vr space because that was early 2014 Everybody was trying to get into VR, but who knew anybody? And so he created a thing in, you know, LA and was able to start, you know, put stuff together. Emmy finalist for outside innovation, and interactive media too, just looking at his, his Wikipedia, his LinkedIn. And so 
I've watched people go out there and sort of create opportunities by themselves by creating opportunities for other people. You, literally, you can just be, hey, everybody, my house Tuesday, who's interested in blank? And you get people who show up and things come from that. So if you're thinking that you have nothing to work with or don't know anybody, you'd be surprised. Yeah. I mean, also, if there's one thing that is a benefit of getting older is that you realize like how much a little thing that you're just screwing around with, how much it can have the, the, the habit and, uh, of, of all of a sudden becoming a big thing. And you look back and you're like, Oh wow. Holy sh holy, holy crap. We, we were all hanging out and like doing a thing like way back before anybody <laughs> knew anything about anything. I mean, uh, you know, I, I certainly feel like that with podcasting, but now I look at, at the fact that I have a very safe career, which is the craziest thing in the world, because there was certainly a, a large period of time where it was just me very excitedly telling my mom, Hey, look at this thing that I'm doing. And she saying like, how much you get paid? Nothing, mom. That's the brilliant part. Uh, <laughs> and now I, I have people from major media companies that ask me how to set up Patreons and what the, the, the best and, and worst practices are on it as it looks more and more like the business model that Brian and I have, have, have built on and, and we've uh, spent a lot of time in is now the dominant way that media will get paid subscription and uh, uh, stuff like that membership looks like it's going to be it. There's going to be like three or four places that can suck up ad dollars. And other than that, there will just be niches and like, wow, that's crazy. It's crazy that we spent so much time doing it. And now all of a sudden it's, it, it, it's worthwhile, but you don't know what that's going to be until you put in the, the, the interest and uh, or put in the effort, which is, you know, just another sign of, just doing stuff, doing stuff instead of thinking about why the thing you're doing is smart or good or bad. It's like, yes, to all of them. It'll probably be all of those things at some point. But if you do it, the skills you gain from continuing to learn a craft or learn a field, you're, you're going to be surprised at how much you can slowly merge in one way or another the more you learn stuff uh, to make it worthwhile. Yeah, I was looking at, uh, yeah, there are two major magic orgs. There's the Society of American Magicians, the International Brotherhood of Magicians, which were just started with somebody says, let's do this. And then some other city, like, we like to do this too. Cool. Here are our bylaws. Here's the name. Go do this. And you do this. The next thing you know, you have a worldwide organization. And if you're in the magic community, you know, you can kind of go to any city, find somebody in that society, call them up and have a tour guide get to see around get that maybe even have a couch to stay on and that's kind of a cool thing that you can create that and i was looking at the uh the list of the past presidents of the uh international brotherhood of magicians and and this is what's funny when it shows like how small this is i'm going to name a couple names justin sean farquhar okay uh oscar munoz michael finney these are all people we've met these are all people we know yeah and that's kind of the crazy part is you think about like how how small these roles can be once you get into them, they may seem like very opaque on the outside. And then you get into it. You're like, well, oh, magic, yeah, magic, magic specifically is 12 people wide yeah. and 12 people deep. And, and even AI can be like that. You know, oh, you yeah. start to realize that, that, you know, you, even companies get big, you start to talk to people like, oh yeah, I know so-and-so I know this person, you know, or you know that. And so any field can be like that. Especially early ones. And that's, you know, the benefit of, I think our existence has been, we've been very early on a lot of stuff, which you know, you're really early when you think you're late <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, when it's like, and, and, and I've told this story a million times, but uh, when a celebrity started a podcast and I was like, ah, too bad podcasting's done. You know, it's really on the back end now. And it was Kevin Smith. He had a whole decade, a new arc of his career that eventually came from starting Smodcast. And, and now he's on the other side of that. Right. And podcasting continues to go. We had the, the largest podcasting contract again, get cut, you know, a couple months ago. So it is still on some level growing. I had a conversation with a friend who was a programmer about creating an internet company. And I had, you know, and my, my infinite wisdom and said, you know, I think kind of the big ones, I think the big opportunity is gone. This is 1996. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that is a good, that's, that, that, that's, you know, 
I ran into my uh uh not my my little brother little brother my little little brother who is uh my my stepfather's son uh he is now turned 18 and so when I was in Orlando uh me and my cousin were saying like all right well what what would you what would we tell him we were talking to him and we we're like what would we tell 18 year old us and I think that's that might be one thing that I'll tell him is like number one just get involved with stuff I was like look AI play around with AI like he's into to you know he, he was thinking about infosec I'm like trust me like you need any stuff we'll be able to hook you up that's a that's a really good trade too if you if that interests you uh but also this is a good thing if you're into a niche you might actually be early if you think you're late <laughs> if, if, if you think you're late that means that you understand it enough to know what is happening but uh uh you know, I, I, so I was at a dinner the other night, night before, and, you know, the question came like, where are we right now at AI? And, you know, the guy next to me is super smart, invested in a number of big companies and said, I think it's early 2000s. And I'm like, I'm going to say, I think it's early 90s. Like, I, I think it's early 90s. Yes. And uh, anybody who thinks, well, it's, ha and we're all looking at like, yeah, we like the chat GPT is not the final form. These aren't the final, like there will be chat bots, chat things like this, but we don't know. We're still learning how people use these things. I think that I said, I said, I said, I think the big players are already on the scene, but there's going to be dozens of other players that could be big and bigger in some respects and whatnot. I'd say like, yeah, I don't, I, it's so early right now. And if somebody goes, ah, I don't know about getting in or now, or like, like, you know, it's, it's never easy. It's never been easier to get in. There's never been more opportunity than now. I don't uh, regret that I didn't try to launch an AI company four years ago. I think, yeah, I think you're 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 in you're in a richer environment for it now. Uh, yeah. There there was an article that came out this week that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the actual number, but it was like eighty percent of Americans like don't use AI, and I'm like, God, I'll bet you that there was a headline in the mid nineties or the late nineties as the internet was something that was like beginning to come onto the mainstream radar where it had almost the exact thing. It just read like 80% of Americans don't use the internet. And it's like, it was, it was put out there as like, well, is AI a fad? And it's like, Oh God, it's, it's all happening again. It's all, it's the same. It, it's all the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I just realized Get that in. Uh, 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 we never even talked about the the rampant speculation about. Uh, uh, well, I guess I'd, uh, that might be too much inside baseball. But uh, speaking for myself, I read an article that implied that perhaps OpenAI and Apple would have an integration. That would be interesting. That's the thing that Brian. I, said. I have zero. I, I am. I have nothing. I have no problem talking about this. I have no. You know, remember I've now left uh, the company. You know was September of last year. Mm, so, interesting, because yeah. the information reported that the negotiations have been ongoing since 2023. Why are you lying to the audience, Andrew? I'm joking. Let's move <laughs> what on. What part of 2023? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, I wasn't called in on everything. Huh. In fact, I was called in on very few things. A uh, <laughs> likely oh. story. How do they communicate with each other without their communications director? <laughs> no, he, uh, so, yeah, that is the rumor is that, that, that it's all over the tech press, and they're saying it's like a done deal, which TBD, that Apple is going to put ChatGPT into the iPhone. And... I have said, I don't know what brand my next phone is going to be, but it's going to have chat GPT built into it on a base level and whatever company that is, that's whose phone I'm buying. Uh, yeah, this follows a lot of reporting. Um, you know, the, the rumors are that we're going to see something at WWDC, which is going to happen in about a week. So, uh, we won't have to wait long. Uh, if, if these particular rumors are indeed true, um, I think there, there's a lot of really interesting technical stuff that Andrew has pointed out in terms of if it were going to be a thing like there, there, it does have to satisfy some elements of uh, Apple's commitment to privacy. Uh, but God, is it overdue uh, uh, for some of these voice assistants to not be the dumbest things on the planet? Oh my like, God. And if, 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 
I, I don't want to go on a rant here, but like like for the uh, for for the for the first mover advantage that Apple had with Siri to just watch Siri become like a third place. A, 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 a dip a doodle when it comes to just, just, just the, 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 the end of flowers for Algernon just slowly getting dumber and dumber and dumber. It's it's unreal. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, today it rained last night. Did you guys get a lot of rain out here, Bray? Yeah, yeah, we did. So I was like, like, wow, it seemed like it rained a lot. Like, like it was it was really really coming down. So just being able to ask an assistant, uh, hey, how much rain came down? In Austin, separated it out by uh, uh, different regions where it was most rain, where it was least rain. Uh, and then I asked for my zip code. Hey, for this zip code. And he's like, yeah, I, I would estimate it's about one inch. And, you know, gives me sources for everything. I can go double check the work. But, like, for uh, uh, for what I wanted, God, I mean, for that to be able to be built in and have access to my contacts, my messages, Oh, that's powerful. Well, that's and powerful. plus also it's like, you know, over time, uh, I uh, would trust open, uh, open AI to be able to say, like, I could ask a bunch of questions, but the only thing I really want to know is when I take my dog for a walk, is the, the, the little tiny Creek river going to be running? And I could just ask that and it could say, you know, it did rain this much over the last few hours. Traditionally, you know, per the pictures that you've shown, uh, it looks like, uh, uh, yeah, you'll have a nice little trickle. And when it isn't, you can make it apologize to you. Wait. <laughs> so a big, a big, big thing happened like two days ago was GPT-4.0, the brand new model we've talked about before, uh, is now the default model even for the free tier. Yeah. So... Everybody has that. And most people, their experience has been GPT 3.5, which is, you know, two years old and you know, old. And so now you're, you get a, you know, a certain limited number, but GPT 4.0 being the default is phenomenal. And 4.0 you is think about, so like, much better about image generation, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. To, to yeah. be able to iterate with an image, uh, I've had a lot more luck, uh, you know, for specifically like, uh, uh, I, I needed a, a picture of an old television with a political ad on it because the politics episode was about political ads. And so I was like, give me that. But it had dumb writing on it, like, just without the writing. Boom. Gave it to me. Like, that was something that was very hard to do uh, 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 iteratively with uh, earlier models of Dolly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, man, my pick is uh, Hacks Season 3. Guess what just got renewed for a Season 4 over the last week? Hacks. Uh, oh. it's, a, it's a good show. Look at that. Look at that. Jeez. Uh, I'll tell you what. Oh, uh, uh, I finally watched the Defunct Land episode about Fast Passes. Oh, the, I was in, uh, the lines episode. Yeah, because I was in I was in Disney, and I I uh, am really frustrated by how bad they screwed up the Fast Pass system. And it was good to see uh, uh, a a YouTube video that reminded me. Indeed, I was at the golden age of Fast Pass. That that one day, a very brilliant man invented an awesome way to make theme parks better, and indeed they were. And then it's slowly taking a bunch of incompetent middle managers uh, uh 20 something years to nickel and dime every little part of it so they could take something that actually made people's lives better and make it more expensive and dumber so uh, uh i was i was happy to see that i'm not going crazy indeed the world uh, uh at least as as far as fast passes go has been declining to stupidity <laughs> yeah uh i'll double down on that i thought it was a really really well done video um and Man, yeah, I uh, have no urge to go see Good at Disney anytime because they just complicated things so much. No, it's easy, Andrew. You just wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, God. And you join the virtual queue so you can eventually pay $60 to get on a ride. I, I that wish I had given. music. You'll have I a could, window I could of a period that. of time that you can go. Maybe. Don't worry. It's magical. It's magical. And if you miss your 6 o'clock window, don't worry. There's a 2 o'clock window. All right. Yeah. They, 
I think, Brian, it's very simple. I know it is. So, Guardians of the Galaxy, right, Cosmic right. Rewind. How, how's it been? How's it Virtual cue. Swear to God. Swear to God. No Andrew, physical cue. Andrew. Andrew, please. It's been weird. Yeah, uh, after even. <laughs> after. So, I'm sorry. It's really been weird, though, too. Once you've joined the virtual All cue, right. it's even simpler. <laughs> I cut it off. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, crap, guys. Uh, I, I I have a fair bit to do today, so uh, I don't think I can. Hang I'm gonna go eat a taco. Long. Oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do we have to start with all that that I'm hunger eat a tar- taco. time travel? Uh, all right. We love you guys on the stream. We're shutting it down. All right. B T T Y L. Uh, Justin, that yeah. link, I never uploaded last week's episode, so I'm a little behind. Um, I know you sent it to me. I'm trying to remember where you sent it to me. The what? Last week's episode we recorded. Oh, uh, oh two weeks ago? Yeah, it's in Dropbox.